Uh, All right, people, today is quite a day because we hear so much about this weird world just beyond the 9 to 5, full of extraterrestrial contact, multidimensional beings, secret society rituals, and while many of us long to have a personal experience that validates that some of these strange things are going on, for most of us, the best we can do is spend some time with one of the lucky few to have not just one, but a lifetime of first-hand contact with otherworldly entities and a little whining and dining with those powerful puppet masters. And lucky for us, that's just the kind of guest we have today. His name is Simon Parks, and several years ago he came forward and disclosed not only the lifelong interactions with entities, but also the fact that he's been born into one of the powerful Illuminati bloodlines. Interestingly enough, after making these declarations, he was still elected to public office in Whitby, North Yorkshire as a town councillor. So the people are with him, and he's got fascinating stories to tell and valuable insights to share, and I can't wait to get down to it. Simon, my man, welcome to THC. Hi, Greg. I'm really pleased to be with you. Well, man, I'm pleased to have you here. I've listened to hours of your stories about some of these experiences, and I've heard some interesting info from you in terms of the goings-on of the planet's elite and their plans for us. It's very insightful. And to get us started, let's take some time to walk through the experiences you had with these beings throughout your childhood, because that's really what sets the stage for all the other things you've been talking about. I mean, how early did all this start? When was the first time you remember really being in contact with something that was non-human? Well, Greg... Um, I was very little. Uh, I was in my crib, and so probably about six months old. That's my first memory um, on this planet. I'm remembering looking through the, the bars of the crib, the wooden slats of the crib, and seeing some very strange legs. And thinking to myself, you know, that doesn't sort of look like my mother's legs. And then the next thing is um, two, two hands coming down, picking me up. Uh, not hurting me, just gripping me quite firmly around the middle and then lift it up. And then I remember my head dropping forward because I was too little to be able to have any control over my head. So my head would just be lolling about. And then I remember my head falling forward and looking straight into the face of what researchers would call uh, a mantis. And all I can re- remember is some very, very short communication That's from mind to mind communication. And then a sensation of falling, falling backwards. I was looking into the creature's eyes and then there was this big, big sensation of falling down a hole and then everything went black. And that's all I remember from that. And that would be the very first memory as a very young baby. Wow, man, that is just intense. And as I understand it, this wasn't just a random selection. There's actually a reason why this happened to you of all people, right? Well, maybe it would just be useful for your listeners to say that my family is not a it's not a military family. I don't come from a military family, but I come from what we would say in Britain is an espionage family. I guess what you guys would say a spy, <laughs> a spy family. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to cover that later or whether you want me to talk about that now. What do you want to do, Greg? Let's talk about it now. It seems to be connected to this extraterrestrial contact, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I would. I would indeed. Um, My grandfather worked for the British uh, Secret Service, and that's called the SIS. That's the Secret Intelligence Services. That's MI6, and that's the foreign intelligence. So in Britain, MI6 is responsible for spying outside of Britain. Makes sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, And he was a British diplomat. He was a British consul, and he was based in the British Embassy in India. Uh, He was also a very high-ranking Freemason. Uh, He was heavily decorated. He he had the uh, Order of the British Empire Medal. He was made a commander of the British Empire. He was going to be knighted and made a sir, but he refused that, turned it down. Hmm. After he'd finished doing his work there, he was then Britain's representative to the United Nations. So he represented Britain at the UN in the 60s. He met. John F. Kennedy uh, in about 1961. He met Joseph Stalin uh, about three years before Stalin died. He really, really did travel around, and his job wasn't a field man. He wasn't like a, a James Bond or a, 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 our man Flint. He was very much a guy who sat in an armchair and made telephone calls and met people and made stuff happen. He had two children, a uh, son and a daughter, and his daughter became my mother. Uh, and she worked for another arm of British security called MI5, which is known as the British Security Service. But I guess what 
I think your listeners would be really interested in is that although my grandfather was working for MI6, he was really working for the CIA. And my mother, who was working for MI5, was really working for the National Security Agency, the NSA. So because both my mother and my grandfather were born in Britain, they had to be locally managed by um, the British Security Service, which is a great ally of America, and America trusted it. But ultimately, they were working for America. And I think that's something that British people just don't understand, they just don't get, that the American secret system covers nearly the whole of the globe. So I, I grew up in an environment that was very, very espionage ridden. And so my experiences, I think, should be seen in, in line with the fact that it's just not a coincidence. It's no coincidence that I've come from that sort of background. And then it seems, as we say in England, we have a saying, which is the world and his wife. <laughs> the world and his wife seem to be interested in what I do. So I think that's probably quite useful for any of your listeners who haven't uh, heard any of my presentations before. After the experience I've talked about, I did have a, have a few visits from the Greys. I don't see them very often. I don't like them. I don't get on with them very well. But I had, uh, I'm trying to think how old I would have been, probably about one years old. And I remember I was capable of sitting up um, on the floor, just couldn't move around, but I could sit up. And there were three greys around me, not like the greys that we see on Hollywood. These had much smaller eyes and their heads bulged out at the back a lot more. And I thought what I saw was all my toys spinning in the air above my head. And I remember looking at it and thinking, oh, that's exciting. And then it changed. And they weren't toys at all, but they were images. They were uh, geometric shapes, brightly different colors. And then one of the greys to my right-hand side sent me a telepathic message, which was, look, feel, understand. Just those three words, look, feel, understand. And I take it that, that there was some form of message or something in this, these shapes that were literally appeared to be like holographic, like a, like a ball floating in the air. So that was my first experience of the greys. Uh, and then after I had a lot of reptilian encounters before then having um, what we would call shadow being, or shadow people counters, and then it came back to the mantids. So one race at a time seemed to be introducing itself to me, Greg. Wow. The mantids experiences. I've, I've heard you tell a story about when you had chicken pox as a young boy, and I thought that was fascinating. Could you tell the people about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, that is interesting because the two guys who researchers would refer to as men in black both had American accents. Mm. And so that is, I think, quite useful for you guys to, to, to again, to understand that American agents travel the whole world. Um, it was 1963. I lived in a place called Hove, which is in the county of um, Sussex on uh, the seaside, down by the, the beach. And uh, my mother uh, worked in a solicitor's. And I remember on the, I guess, over the weekend, no, uh, Thursday, Friday, I developed chicken pox. And I don't know what they do with children now, but we used to have this stuff that you dabbed on, you painted it on your spots, and it was a bright yellow color. And on the Friday, um, mother had uh, done that for me, and she put some food on the table next to the bed and a glass of water, and then said to me, um, well, I'm off to work. Now, that's probably shocking, and that would be child child abandonment, I guess, in, <laughs> in, in America, because I was three and a half years old. But as she went out the door, she said, don't worry, they will look after you. Mm. And not long after she'd gone, this guy comes in, and he looks like a waiter. And I said, who are you? And he said, I'm your doctor. Um, and I thought, oh, it's come to make my chicken pox, pox better. <laughs> and he gives me a glass of stuff which I have to drink, which I drink. And then um, the mantids are there, and they want to put an implant into my left hand. And they say, can we do this? So I said, does, and I use the word mummy, because that is the name that I referred to the mantid that has always dealt with me. Does, um, remember, I'm three and a half years old. Does mummy want me to have this? Mm -hmm. Because I was a bit, a bit nervous. And they said, well, if you want mummy to know where you are, 
all the time. And if you want mummy to know if ever you're sick, so that mummy can come to you at any time of the day or night, then this is a good thing. If you don't want that, then this is a bad thing and you shouldn't have it. So I said, well, I do want you know, that to happen. I do want to, you know, if I'm sick, I do want to be made better. So anyway, they started to put it in. Um, it's incredibly difficult to explain in English because the skin on my hand peeled away and there was absolutely no blood. And it was that that really terrified me and I started screaming. So what they did was they went into my mind and projected a giraffe and a cheetah and another animal which appeared to be in the room dancing and running around the room. So my attention was taken with that. And then while they did that, they just, it, while I was watching that, they repaired my hand. It's not unlike a doctor in a 3D world when he's about to give an injection to a child. He says to the child, look away. Don't watch the needle going into your arm. And this is exactly the same thing, but far more sophisticated. So anyway, that was done. And then the doorbell goes on the apartment because we only lived in a small apartment. And the creatures stiffen up. They, they're quite tense. And I said, well, you know, who is that? Because I knew they would know. And their reply was, your government. Hmm. Your government. And then the wardrobe, or what you would call a, a closet, I think. We call it a wardrobe. Then the doors open and two guys come out, which is absolutely bizarre. But as a three and a half year old kid, this was just exciting. And they had white shirts on, black ties, sunglasses, both had short black hair, black suits, black shoes, and white socks. And they both carried guns. And I remember because I was really into westerns, and these weren't revolver type westerns. Um, my favorite gun is the Navy Colt 1861 model. <laughs> um, and uh, these weren't at all like that. These were um, what you would call a pistol, you know, a, a, probably similar to a Glock. Yeah. And uh, they both said, hello, hello, absolutely happy and cheerful, I suppose to show me that, that I needn't be scared. And then one went and stood by the door and pointed his gun at the door, and the other one stood by the window and pointed his gun at the window. Um, and then another one was outside, and then some greys came in and started pulling all the curtains. In, in the apartment, because they were only little, about uh, three foot tall, about a yard tall, they could be underneath the window, so nobody could see them doing it. It was quite clever, that. Um, then it all seemed to go, and then the two guys just uh, walked into the hall. I never heard the front door go, and they just had gone. I don't know how they got out. So they didn't go through the wardrobe. They just went out into the hall, and that was it. And I was left with one grey. And he said to me, I'm going to wait here until your mother, he actually said, till your human mother returns. That's how they always refer to my biological mother as my human mother. When, when your human mother returns, I will go. So I don't like gray, uh, grays, Greg, and um, I never have done him since I was three and a half years old. So anyway, I had a glass of water by the side of my bed, and I said to him, fill my glass of water up, because there was a ewer next to it, a jug to pour it in. And he looked at it, and he sent me a message saying, well, why don't you drink what's in the glass first, and then I'll fill it up for you. And then I said to him, uh, you, know, you shouldn't be questioning me. You, know, you should just do. And he said, yes, I should. So he filled it up, and then I deliberately didn't drink from it. Huh. And, and he said, why don't you drink from it? And I said to him, your, your, your position is not to question. You should just do. And he says, yes, I should. And then, not long after that, um, I hear the front door go, a key going in the latch, and suddenly he, he gets grey, gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and turns into an owl, literally, at the foot of the bed. And he, he seems, in my mind, to be, I don't know, about, about the size of a, what you'd have as a coin as a nickel, so quite small. And then it just seemed to fly out through the gap in the window. And then my mother came in and said, oh, how are you? I said, fine. And I said, oh, look, I've done all my colouring books, and she wasn't interested in that. And she said, it's all right, I don't have to go back to work this afternoon. So that, that's the experience from 1963, Greg, and I would have been about three and a half years old. Wow, yeah, that is uh, an amazing story. And the aspect that the gray turns into an owl, that's really fascinating to me. I guess these non-physical beings, they can maybe shapeshift in some way, but you have the elites going to Bohemian Grove, and there's a giant owl statue there. There is a little tiny, tiny owl hidden in the $1 bill. Mm. 
And also you can fold the $1 bill into the image of a gray too. So it's like, I wonder if this is connected in some way. Have you ever seen the owl connected to extraterrestrials in any other way other than that experience? Um, yes. Interestingly enough. Wow. I was once on a very large alien spacecraft. I never call it a UFO because UFO means unidentified flying objects. And I know what these things are. <laughs> so it's on an <laughs> alien spacecraft. And I guess it was as big as an aircraft carrier. So it seemed to me. Date-wise now, Greg, this would be 1971. So I'd have been about 11 years old. And there were just thousands of greys lying on metal beds. Thousands of them. I just cannot describe to you, Greg, just thousands of them just were on the bed. And I, I, was, I had to sleep because I... This is when I was away for two days. I was very tired, and I'd been told there was a bed made ready for me. And as we were walking along to go to this bed that was reserved for me, all these greys were sitting on these metal beds, and there were lights flashing underneath. Now, to the world, they looked like they were sleeping. But I suppose I had some experience even by that age, and I sent a message to the mantid that was with me and said, Oh, they're learning. And what I realized I meant now was they were being programmed. They were actually on a bed, but those flashing lights was a program being put into them like you would a computer. But I didn't know that. All I said was they are learning. And he stops because we're walking and he stops and he turns to me and he says, because he always calls me the Adam. They've always called me the Adam. And he said, the Adam is as wise as an owl. Hmm. And throughout my history, they've made comments. So uh, about three years ago, I thought, what I'm going to do is go to an owl sanctuary. I'm going to buy a half a day um, day there. You can actually go and feed the owls and fly them. Because I really wanted to know what is all this about? You know, why do they keep making references to owls? So I went there, and that's my picture on my Facebook page. Is that's where I'm like had an owl. Yeah. And I've been feeding it and flying it. And I was really sad to learn that owls are quite stupid. (laughs) Owls are very dumb birds. Um, but they all link back to Greek, ancient Greek history, where Athena had the owl and the owl was supposed to be wise. And through all our history, we thought of owls being wise, but as a bird, they're not very clever. So that's the link there, Greg. That's interesting. <laughs> I was just kind of curious about that. Funny that it worked out. So you, you mentioned that they call your mother your human mother and contact often is connected with hybridization programs and being called the atom also seems to kind of allude to that did they ever uh, elaborate on that at all like are you part of a hybridization program um well i don't know how far down the rabbit hole your listeners really are green <laughs> oh we go all the way oh okay then um my my body is relatively human it has to be because I have to pass amongst everybody else. If it doesn't look human and it isn't human, it's not going to work. You see a lot of hybrids around that obviously look hybridized. But if you want something to be able to get on and do what it needs to do, it can't be stopped every five minutes to be checked out. So it's not the body that's important. It's the soul, the spirit inside it. My soul is composed of three parts, one third mantid, one third hollow earth human and one third reptilian and in total balance it had to be in total balance because if a soul isn't in balance then you become very ill your body falls apart you can have lots of different issues so as difficult for many people to understand as it is what i've been told is that the soul that inhabits my body inhabited the first viable human body Now, that doesn't mean higher Earth humans like Palladians or Lyrans, but after the fall of Atlantis and uh, the Great Flood, then the reptiles had uh, done a lot of genetic engineering to humankind and reduced humans' standing and their ability. So a lot of humans' abilities were taken away by the reptiles, a sort of a dumbing down process. And a lot of the models made didn't work, and then they had one model that worked, and the soul it was decided that because the, the reptiles, the mantids, had been involved in this process, then they should eat equally um, share in the first male and female that were created. So they should impart 
their own signature to that creature, those two creatures, the male and female, which we now know as Adam and Eve, because it was symbolic of the fact this was the first male and female that had been successfully created after all the experimentation. However, these are human bodies and you need human soul in there. You can't just put a reptilian or a mantid in there because it would break the universal law. Um, mm -hmm. So they use different human souls. There are many different sorts of human souls. So the soul in my body goes right back there. And that is why through bloodline, you know, I am followed. My family is followed and I have a have family and they're also followed as well. And I know that my grandfather was followed. So it goes back thousands of years and it's about your bloodline. Yes, your genetics. Yes, but it's about your soul. It's just what is inside you that counts. So that's why they call me the Adam, um, and uh, it's uh, it's been a one a hell of a hell of a roller coaster, right? <laughs> I should say so. And I've heard you talk about the soul aspect before, and I was a little bit confused because I guess traditionally I've thought of life as being uh, you know the soul or consciousness as part of some universal life force and things like humans or mantids or whatever kind of being you may encounter would be just like uh, vessels. And that's just been my, I guess, what I assumed. But it seems now more like the, the souls are actually meant for the specific containers rather than soul being one thing and then various three-dimensional bodies being just vessels. So it's, it really is your soul is connected to the, to the species, so to speak. Yes, it has to be that way. If you can imagine... Uh, somebody a soul incarnating in um, a male body after male body after male body and then skipping it and incarnating into a female body and that's why when that occurs many many females or males it's the other way around are very confused I'm not saying that's the answer in all cases but uh, but occasionally that's what happens because what happens is that a soul can begin to take on the genetic signature of the body around it just as the body takes on the signature of the soul um, if you create a body um, that's not capable of taking a soul that vibrates at a higher frequency then the body will ultimately reject that soul or will fall apart so if you have a soul from the fourth or fifth or sixth dimension you cannot put that into a normal standard body because the body just can't cope with it, it wasn't designed for that it was designed for a standard 3d earth human soul so what they have to do is take um children babies from their mother's womb take them away from their mother and uh, do genetic alteration to them and then put them back in the mother's womb this is what isn't often understood and then at about the eighth month eight month or sixth month phase come back uh, and take that child as well or do something else to it so when that child is ready, it will take a soul that is compatible with its body. Yes, bodies are vessels. As Greg, you, you're absolutely right, they are. But as, as Jesus said in one of his teachings, you can't put new wine into an old wine sack because an old wine sack that's used to ferment and age wine, if you put a brand new strong wine into it that's just been you know got from the grape, the, the, the sack will split. And he's giving, as Jesus often did, he was speaking in a way that the people at the time didn't understand. So you cannot put a young soul into an old body and you can't put an old soul into a young body. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, Greg. It does, it does. Okay. Uh, this is also fascinating. So you had this ongoing contact being introduced at a young age to these extraterrestrial races. Was there any grooming on the Illuminati side or the human side with all this? Yeah, well, that came from my grandfather. Um, my grandfather, the term we use now is Illuminati. My grandfather most definitely was. We had a king of England who became too close to Adolf Hitler just before the Second World War. And it was decided that the king had to be got rid of. It was a very, very tricky job to get rid of a king, very hard. And the prime minister at the time just didn't feel that he had the strength of will to do it. So he turned to the people who really run the world, um, certainly the, the British element of it, and said, you know, what on earth am I going to do? I've got a real problem here. 
and the Illuminati in England, or Great Britain, said to him, well, form a jury, 12 good men and true, ask them to vote, and whatever the vote is, you can then go to the king and tell him what the result is. And my grandfather was one of those 12 men. He was actually in India at the time, and he got a, a coded cable, which simply said, should the king go or stay? And I said to my grandfather, well, grandfather, what did you vote? And he said, well, I voted the king had to go. And I said to grandfather, what was the result? And I think it was something like 10 votes against the king and two votes to stay. So the prime minister went, went to, to the king and said, um, your country doesn't want you anymore. And the king said, well, can I go on the, the radio? And because there wasn't much TV then, mm -hmm. <laughs> can I go on the radio and tell the people? And the king was told that the doors to the radio station are locked. You won't let you in. This is the king of England. <laughs> and as I often say to people, you know, the king is unelected. He's a royal person there through bloodline. And yet the 12 men of the jury, none of them were elected. They were all civil servants. So you had unelected people getting rid of other unelected people. And you had the population of Britain not having a clue what was going on. And this was 1936. So you can imagine what it's like now. So my grandfather was um, incredibly high up, not just in government, but in, in world in the world situation. Um, a very influential man, very, very powerful. You know, to go in, from Britain, to go to see Joseph Stalin to talk about alien technology. <laughs> uh, and Stalin said, give me 10 years and I'll have infiltrated the CIA. Wow. So after the Second World War, you see, um, we had a Labour government in Britain and sadly the uh, American government really liked Winston Churchill and they thought Winston Churchill was going to be re-elected and he wasn't and so they just turned their back on Great Britain for about five or six years so my grandfather was sent to the Soviet Union to say okay what do you know about Roswell because that's what we were all interested in back in those days can you tell us anything about Roswell because the Americans aren't telling us anything and Stalin said no I can't but you give me 10 years and I will have infiltrated the CIA and I'll tell you everything. <laughs> now, he never did tell anything because it was just a big game of politics going on. But it shows that uh, how quickly allies can fall out. Right, right. You know, we talk about a lot of conspiracy stuff in the show and we talk about the elites fairly often. And to have an actual insider, to have an actual member of the Illuminati bloodline here is, I mean, you know, it's pretty awesome. And I'm curious... Because the elite's plan seems to be multi-generational, and contact with these entities also seems to be multi-generational when you hear from people who are contactees. Is this kind of how the Illuminati introduces their children into this hidden aspect of life and kind of gets them with the, their multi-generational programs? How much time have we got left, Greg, on your show? <laughs> uh, well, it's a two-hour show. Okay, cool. Um because the, the question you've asked is incredibly important. All of your questions have been important, but this is incredibly important because there are so many aspects to this. Mm -hmm. I really don't want to miss something on that's important. Oh, sure. Take uh, your time. Okay. Um, it depends on the individual soul to come into that child and what the purpose of that child is to be. So, for instance, if you are going to be you're destined to be a businessman or a businesswoman, a financier, then your training as a child will be very different. And if you come into a religious family or a uh, political family, now my family um, was a magical family. So magic was the key mover. My grandfather was a Satanist, but my mother was not. And they would argue over my upbringing because they both agreed in magic and they both practiced magic. But uh, my mother was uh, for the white magic and my grandfather was for the, for the dense magic. Wow. Um, and about two years ago now, I had a, an approach from an arm of the Illuminati asking me if I would like to join one of the magical groups of the pyramid. Um, if you think of the Illuminati as a pyramid, then you can divide the sides into the different disciplines that exist, whether you're a banker, 
the military side, the religious side. So the Knights Templars would be down one side, if you like, and then you would have your know, Rothschilds down another side. And so what they will do is they'll look at an individual and say, well, which house will he or she be best placed in? Where will, which is their home? So they offered me a non-satanic uh, magical arm of the Illuminati, which I very politely turned down. I didn't want that hmm. uh, because I suppose what they thought was, you know, what he, he hasn't been inducted or has not been initiated officially into the Illuminati, so maybe we'll do it now. Well, I, I didn't want that. That's not, not what I wanted. The, the problem for them is that because I am so connected to what I call extra dimensional entities, I don't call them ETs, the ones I see come from a fourth, fourth dimension, that the humans aren't really allowed to be involved in my life. I need to explain that, Greg. My human mother told me that there are two records kept by the American government of all the people on the earth, <clears throat> not just in, in the States. And on one part of the book were all the genuine contactees and abductees, the real people, the real deal. And then there was a much smaller list at the back of the book and these were people that the government had been told it had no jurisdiction over, that the aliens basically were in charge of those people. So the government had to relinquish its responsibility over those individuals. Now, Greg, I can get a parking ticket and I'll have to pay it, and I have to pay my taxes, but that's where it stops. And when I do my talks and I go up and down the country, Great Britain, and I do my lectures, I give many, many examples of where things have happened uh, and the state treats me completely differently. Um, and the best way is to, to, you know, at my talks is to give examples. So my own biological mother told me that right back in the 1970s, you know, you will be treated differently. And I don't exist on any records even now. The, if you put my name into a government computer, all that will come up is where I'm living now. And I know this for a fact because uh, for many years, <clears throat> I was what we call in England a driving instructor. I think stateside you call them driving teachers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, you have to go through lots of exams and lots of tests, which are very difficult now. And I passed. But my goodness me, it was so hard to, to get there simply because they had no record of me being in the country. Um, they asked me, what schools did you go to? And I gave them a list of all the schools, checked all the records. Nope, you never went to this school. We have no record of you. Um, no record of my, in, 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 in the hospital or the doctor's nothing. There was no record. And they did exactly the same my grandfather. Um, my grandfather doesn't exist. If you look through his records now, there's nothing except uh, my daughter who worked for the army, British army for a short while. She was able to get me some evidence, which I've got. And I, when I do my lectures, I can actually show proof that he was who he was, but it's not in the public domain. So I suppose I'm a bit of an enigma to the system because uh, they don't really know what to do with me, Greg. <laughs> That's uh, it's just so fascinating. It's interesting that you have such a, you know, you, you have the ability to turn down these things. I was always kind of under the impression that it was somewhat forced because they're, they seem to be so good at getting people on board with the program in the families. Can Do you know of any other people who have rejected the multi-generational plan like you have? No, I think they will end up dead, Greg. <laughs> Man, so you said you're from a magic family. That's probably the most fascinating side of the pyramid to me. Okay. And we've talked about magic pract or we've talked to magic practitioners before, but nothing of such a high ranking level. How have you seen magic used in your family or what are the limitations or the effects of magic in this world? Well, I, I practice magic. <clears throat> Greg, you need to understand that as well. With depending on um what one's bearing is what one is allowed to do. I don't mean allowed to do by a system or by any hierarchical grouping, but by your own abilities and where you are naturally connected. So when I talk about magic, I, I talk about connecting with interdimensional entities. These are beings that neither exist in the third or fourth dimension. And when we call them jinn, um, people have other names for them. And to be able to conjure a djinn um, is, is very high magic. Um, and it's, it's what the uh, satanic group, it's what the top rank of the Illuminati are all about. They're all about bringing forward what you could loosely call a demonic 
form. But remember, uh, Hollywood makes a demon something bad. Being a demon isn't bad. It's actually what you're instructing that demon to do or what agreement you're making with that demon. Because most people will use a demonic energy for bad purposes. Um, but the actual creature itself isn't necessarily bad. It's just being offered a deal. We'll give you this if you do this for us. So magic tends to be about seeing the future, uh, influencing other people's decisions, changing the future, not just influencing it, but actually changing it. It's very hard to go back and change the past, but you can certainly alter and change timelines, the future, if you have the right know-how. And basically controlling people. So magic throughout the history has been used for bad purposes, generally, to influence and control people. So if you were a magical grouping, you would want to control your politicians because you want them to make decisions that favor you. Um, and why would you want to give them $10 million bribe when you can actually afflict them with magic and make them do something which they think is their own decision anyway? And because most people on the planet don't believe in magic, you can't be caught. How can you be caught out? You can, if you give someone a million dollars and you know the Fed has marked those monies, you, you can get caught. But if you do something magical, nobody's going to believe you know, nobody's going to believe you've done that. So that's what they do. And they do it with pop stars. They do it with porn models. They do it with anybody who's vulnerable um, and they want to blackmail them. If they can't blackmail them, they'll use magic on them. So it's a very, very common practice. Um, it's, it's, it's so common that, you know, it's, it's just normal now. <laughs> yeah, I'm learning that it's uh, it seems to be a lot more normal, although in typical everyday life, in the mainstream, it's completely disregarded as silliness. And of course, that would be to keep people from attaining any type of power that could possibly be within their grasp. But I am so interested in getting into magic and exploring its possibilities. Oh. Is there a good way that you would recommend someone approach it if they if they wanted to get some type of personal validation of these powers? You, you can do. Um, I, you've got to go down the white magic route. Mm -hmm. if you want to stay sane. <laughs> I'm absolutely serious with you. If you want to stay sane and you want to stay sovereign and you want to always be in charge of yourself, then you, 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 you find a practitioner. <clears throat> it can be a witch or a wizard who practices white magic. And, you know, you'd have to go in as an adept. You'd have to go in on the first stage and learn your way forward and see if they would school you but the question they would ask you is why do you want to do this that is the question that wheedles people out you know you might have 100 people who want to learn magic and the question to them is why do you want to do this mm -hmm. and you may only have 10 that actually are accepted at the end of it but yeah that's 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 something that you know uh, everyone has it in them that's the important thing but the school system so makes people part of the matrix that that connection to Mother Earth, that connection to the universe, that connection to who we really are is just smashed out of people so that they don't realize just how powerful they are. Now, those of us who have resisted that and have held on and maintained to what we really are, then we have some connection to, you know, what, what makes humans and what makes people special. So um, everybody should be able to levitate something. Everybody should be able to do what Yuri Geller did, which was bend a spoon. Um, but they can't because they don't believe they can do it. Hmm. And that's because the system has done such a very good job at making people think they're not important and they're just pieces of machinery. So, yeah, give it a try. Um, you need to find a very, very spiritual white magic teacher who is really genuine because um, there's lots of shysters out there. But there are some genuine people and just go for it and just practice. Yeah, man, I think I might go down that road. But um, on the subject of the school system and programming, you also have dyslexia, right? And that wasn't really an accident. No. Yeah. I'm, I learned later that I had deliberately been given that so that I wouldn't fall into the matrix. I wouldn't be easily trapped and... I use the word brainwash. Um, mind control is a better one, but I don't mean it in that sense of the word. If you're very happy in your job and you know, you're earning good money and you know, it doesn't matter that you're stressed every day you get home, I mean, you're trapped in the treadmill and that's what you do. 
And so it's very hard to want to break free of that. But if you are on the periphery of it, you might be an artist, a sculptor, you might be a dancer, you might make music, whatever it is. If you're slightly towards that side, then you have a more of a spiritual side to you, maybe. And if you can connect with that. Now, with the dyslexia, what it meant was that my brain isn't wired the same as most people's. There's a, there's a, I can't remember the name, but there's a fantastic American company that only recruits men and women with dyslexia um, simply because when they're doing construction work and they're looking at the plans, somebody with a, a dyslexic mind like mine can look at, say, where the, the power cables need to go and could say, right, we need to go here, here, here and save space and follow the line of the building. Somebody without that has been proven struggles to do that. So modern science, if I can use the word loosely, modern science understands that there's some very useful benefits to having dyslexia. It allows you to think, see, and learn in a completely different way from somebody who doesn't have that. I got dyslexia probably in about 1965 when I was interacting with what we would call a shadow being. And this creature was doing its level best to teach me to be precognitive, to attempt to have some grasp of seeing the future. And it visited me for something between three months and six months on a fairly regular basis. And my schoolwork just went straight down. So bad, in fact, that the school put me on special lessons. <clears throat> my grandfather paid for a teacher to come to the house on a Saturday and a Sunday. But after this creature stopped interacting with me, I noticed that my reading age went up from what had been, I'd been sort of, I don't know, five or six years old. And it was a reading age of 12, just literally overnight. So there were benefits to it in some ways. But yes, <clears throat> I have what doctors would call a short term memory loss. So dyslexia is the overarching, but the doctors don't like that word. So it's a short term memory loss. Or in England, it's called a specific learning difficulty. So it's a very, it's a very, it's, it's measurable on some sort of electronic graph. But yeah, that's what happened. I find that so fascinating because it just shows that certain people involved in Illuminati bloodlines, you know, they, they institute these things so that you can't be controlled in the school system. I just think that's so fascinating because we hear <laughs> about it being a control, you know, a, a brainwashing type of indoctrination program. And there it is right there. That's how they, they keep their special people out from, from getting trapped in it. Greg, you, you, you're absolutely on the button. Well done, you. I didn't say that, but you got it. A, doctor, a practicing doctor, so a qualified doctor who understands this subject, said to me, he said to me, you know what, Simon? He said, you have been programmed so that you can never be programmed. Wow. Yeah, that's well said. Another aspect to your childhood I wanted to talk about is apparently there was a time where you were asked to make a choice for a mentor based on species. Can you tell us about that? Yes, that's been how my whole life has been to decide who I am and where my priorities lie. And it's linked to, you know, the next very few years now with the change in the human race and the, the choice that the human race must make. And just as the human race has to make a choice, so I did. I had to choose between a mentor of a what we would call a Draconis reptilian, that's a white royal reptile, or the Mantid. So I had to choose who was going to be my guardian, who was going to look after me, who was going to educate me. And the Lord High King reptile has a white sword, and that was held before me, and I was told because this is all in physical, it's not energetic. So I was told, be careful, don't hold the sword by the edge, you will cut your fingers, hold it on the two flat sides. So I had to use my thumb and first finger and hold the sword with my one hand. And then I had to pick up the purple robe of office that the senior mantids wear in my other hand. And I was asked to choose who is going to mentor you. And I took my hand away from the sword. So I had two hands on the purple robe and held it above my head which is the symbol that you have to give for choice. So I chose the purple robe of the mantids, so it was to be the mantids that would manage me. So that was my choice. Wow. 
And what can you tell us about the hierarchy of the extraterrestrials? I mean, how much influence do the mantids have in comparison to the reptilians? Why are they all so interested in mankind? And why do they always stay in the shadows? Ha, huh, three questions. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. You'll have to, because of my dyslexia, I'm being serious now, I won't remember all those questions. So I'll, you just have to remind me. So go to the first question now, which was... Um, you know, I can't remember the, oh, the, cool the influence of the hierarchy of these of these beings. Oh, right. Okay. okay. I think, to be honest, that most researchers who have looked into this seriously, they've got it about right. But sometimes even they don't realize the great wealth and depth of the different types of creatures. So the, the reptile race, the one I'm interacting with, which is the Draconis reptilian. Remember, there are many different sorts of reptile race. But the Draconis reptilians consider themselves the creators of mankind. And therefore, they consider themselves the gods of the humans. And they put themselves into the position that we created you, we are your gods. Therefore, we know best and we will do whatever we want. Now, they are very, very warlike. They're fantastic geneticists. Um, they can replicate just about anything, but they're not very creative. So they got into a mindset of going from planet to planet, galaxy to galaxy, conquering, enslaving, and adapting the technology that they came across. And they enslaved some of the gray races and adapt their technology. They also hybridized the gray race to make them very reptilian. And they also put chips in them to control them. And so um, most reptilian uh, spacecraft or reptilian uh, facilities would have greys uh, doing all the menial tasks. And I think researchers have got that absolutely to the button. What you won't see um, is a Nordic on a spaceship with a reptilian or in the base because the Nordics and the reptilians do not get on at all. Now, the Mantids have, you think of your American football game, the Mantid is the referee. And uh, it was long, 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 long time ago realised mm -hmm that unless there was some form of arbiter, some sort of referee, these peoples, these creatures had such fantastic technology, they could probably destroy half a galaxy. So you didn't want to get it to that sort of position. So they all, within the fourth dimension, accepted the mantids as the arbiter. So if there was a very difficult situation, political, which was going to move to a military situation, which was going to cause a lot of damage, then the Mantic would come in and the Mantic would say, this is what you will do. And it, the Mantic would make a decision. And part of my training was to learn that and to make decisions. So I was given um, scenarios, situations, and then asked, what would you do to prevent a war? And what would you do to ensure that one particular race hasn't had its pride damaged? Because with, with the reptilian race, if their pride is damaged, then they will go to war. So hopefully that answers that one. Uh, what was the other question, Greg? Uh, why are they so interested in mankind and stay hidden? Right. Um, they've always been interested in mankind because they consider themselves the gods. The, the human bodies that you're in, Greg, over in the States, and I'm in here over in Britain, are not the same bodies that were here before the reptiles came. So they claim bloodline. They claim the creation of that. Um, they they feed off the energy of mankind. It's no coincidence that in ancient Rome, the arena was built where people would stick swords into each other or chase chariots around and thousands of people would be killed because this created so much emotion, so much energy, that that actually powers these creatures. Um, so they are very interested from that point of view. Other other races that are more benevolent to humankind, probably from the fifth, sixth, and seventh dimension and upwards, they are fascinated with humankind because we don't live very long. Our physical bodies, that is, probably, if we're lucky, go to 100 years. So we have to evolve very quickly. Humankind evolves at a staggeringly fast rate when compared to creatures in other planets and other galaxies. Um, a mantid will live for 2,000 years uh, and then can go clone its body. That's, wow. that's why these creatures have been around since ancient Egyptian times or Sumerian times and are still around today. 
And can you imagine looking at humans who are dying every hundred years? For them, it's just a blink of the eye. One person's life, a hundred years, is just a blink of the eye. That's why they can follow bloodlines for hundreds of years, thousands of years. It's, it's what they do. So they're fascinated because we evolve and change, but we create, Greg. Humans can create. Most of these creatures from the fourth dimension have lost the ability to create as humans do. Humans are multidimensional creators, um, and but they just don't know it. So that's the fascination. And the final one was why do they stay hidden? Because the Draconis reptilians control the planet. I know that there's a lot of speakers on the internet saying all the reptiles have gone. That's not true, because if all the reptiles had gone, this planet would be free. We're no more free now than we were 10 years ago. So there's proof of the pudding that the reptiles haven't gone. They're still there in an energetic phase between the third and the fourth dimension. They are reduced in power. A lot of the deep underground military bases have been destroyed. They have been taken out. Um, that is true, but they're still there. And they stay through the power of their proxies. These are the people who really control the planet. Some of them are purely human. Some of them are a mixture of human and something else. But as long as those, those people still maintain the position of power and wealth, then the planet won't change. So the next question is, well, why are the good guys, the good aliens, why are they staying hidden? And this is, this is, this is a good question. I'm going to give you a real interesting answer here. There's a guy who's very genuine called Alex Collier. And I'm sure your listeners will be aware of him. Um, he doesn't see the same creatures I do. In some ways, he's more fortunate than me because the creatures he sees are higher dimensional creatures. Um, but the problem with that is that they're so evolved that they don't get involved. Um, there's a really interesting case some seven, eight, nine, ten years ago. Um, a young woman was jogging through Central Park and she had told all her college friends that she was loved by the aliens and they believed her. And she was attacked by a mugger in Central Park and she didn't keep her mugger's money with her because she was so convinced that the aliens would protect her. And this guy stuck a knife in her and killed her. And her friends couldn't understand why the aliens let her die. And the problem was because she was in communication with creatures from a very, very high frequency, sixth, seventh, eighth dimension, they don't get involved. It's like the, the old Star Trek Prime Directive. But those creatures that I mix with in the fourth frequency have been meddling in human affairs for thousands of years because they consider they made the human race, therefore they wouldn't stay away. They would be involved and they would meddle. So people like Alex have gone through some very difficult times lately, simply because, not because they've abandoned him, but simply because it's not in their remit to get involved. Whereas when something difficult happens to me, somebody somewhere pays a very high price for it. Interesting. So we tend to assume this is true, but based on your insight, is it pretty safe to say that there is some form of non-human guidance or communication at the head of almost all these secret societies? Oh, yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, right. Depending on the, the – it's not just to do with the, the stars or astrology. There will be certain important dates. But basically what will happen is chairs will be in a, a very special place. Chairs will be put in a circle or a semicircle, and then one very large ornate carved chair will be put in the middle or to one side, and the entity will uh, arrive, sit in the chair, and then all the uh, high-ranking people report, go around clockwise or counterclockwise, doesn't really matter, I don't think, and each one gives a report on the situation, and the entity then tells them what they need to do. And it's like checking in with your, your managing director once a month. <laughs> and uh, would you say that in most of these secret societies, is that a reptilian they're talking to, or are there ones that talk to greys, ones that talk to mantids? No, nobody would talk to a grey because greys are just... Too low on the totem pole. Yes. Mantids, no, because mantids are not involved in the control of mankind. Mantids have... They don't get a kick out of oppressing people. 
Um, it tends to be a reptilian, certainly with the, the very elite bloodline human families. The magical side, the satanic group, will be talking to demonic entities or channeling demonic energy from somewhere else. So um, you have the old guard, the old royals, which are the reptilians, but you have a number of other races now which are popping up and they want a piece of the pie, a piece of the action. And so you have a fragmentation of the Illuminati going on presently, um, whereas they're splitting off and finding their own gods. And in many cases, they're saying, well, we don't need these people anymore. We're strong enough. We're powerful enough. Um, the Illuminati are really, really cross because the reptilians never gave them the new world order. It was supposed to be all done and dusted now. Mm. Um, three quarters of the population were all supposed to be dead. And those that were left were supposed to be enjoying um, a paradise that hasn't been delivered. And so there's a lot of people out there now who they basically turn their back on, on the reptiles and they are trying to form their own government within a government. So there's a lot going on at the moment, Greg. It's, it's, it's fluid. It's very difficult to follow. So to wrap this up, I just you kind of led right into it, but okay. uh, I always like to try to end on a positive note. And Good. we are kind of stuck on the outside of the game, uh, just hearing from insiders like yourself about what's going on. But how can the listeners here, the, you know, myself, how can we hone in and actually contribute to the evolution of humanity and the positive side of things? Okay, because because most humans understand physical, so if they want to get a gun and barricade their house. And they don't understand that that's the world we're leaving. We're moving into a world where thought waves, energy patterns make changes. In other words, if 10,000 people went to Central Square and just sat down for 15 minutes and just sent love and peace uh, to President Obama, his decisions on that day would be totally different from the decisions that he was planning to make. It's not about physically doing, doing things. You don't have to go and throw bricks and bottles. You don't have to go and fight with the police. What you have to do is to actually start realizing that your thoughts, your just your thought waves can make things change. Now, we are taught that that's not the case because the education system does not want to empower people um, they don't want people to realize that they can actually be destinies, I beg your pardon, they can be masters of their own destiny, but it can be. So if people just start thinking, no, I'm not having this, you know, this is not going to work. If you go outside of your door and you say, oh, goodness me, I might catch Ebola today. Oh, dear, oh, dear, I might be knocked down by a yellow cab. Oh, dear, oh, dear, if I go into the bank, I might be robbed. Instead of doing that, if they say, actually, I'm going to walk out of here and I'm not going to catch Ebola, I'm not going to be knocked down by a yellow cab, and I'm not going to be mugged or shot, you are sending very powerful, positive thought waves which change not just your own reality, but the reality around you. So if you can get 50, 100, 1,000 people who start thinking that, you can change your own environment. Um, you know, I'm just wrap it up now. You know, you get these courses where you pay a hundred dollars and you, you know, and you, you empower yourself and you, you sit and you write 50 times on a piece of paper. You know, I will get a well paid job or, you know, I find myself a wife or something like that. Hmm. And everybody writes in and says, it worked, it worked, it worked. It does work, but not because you wrote it down 50 times, but because you believed in it and you thought that and you created your own reality. Human beings are multi dimensional creators of reality and that's what the education system created by the elite doesn't want people to know but, but everybody is capable of doing that so just think good think strong don't be live, don't live in fear don't be scared um, try not to get too angry try to meditate try to uh, join groups of people who are like-minded um, challenge the system but do it in a calm and logical way <laughs> okay, Greg, I'm really tired, so I think we're coming right. in. So I, I always use up a huge amount of energy when I do these um, shows because I'm here on a mission, whatever that might be, um, and I'm really quite tired now. So I, I'm, I'm glad we've come to an end, my friend. <laughs> For sure. Great advice. Thanks so much, Simon. My mind has been thoroughly blown. Tons of interesting information. <laughs>